Okay, good morning. Um, we're going to do shlach in a minute, but I want to share with this. I, I always try to find something that's somewhat related to what Rabbi Sachs is going to teach in um, in our Sefer. And this this is called the hardest word to hear. The people have this expression, like, what's the hardest thing for you to say? Sorry. Sorry. What's the hardest thing to hear? It's your fault. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, probably, probably. Um, people are not everybody's good at taking criticism. Uh, not everybody's good at rejection, right? Um, so listen, he says, for fifty years, Goldberg has been the most regular of synagogue attendees. Twice a day, he was there to say his prayers. Then suddenly, he wasn't there. Weeks passed, and his familiar face was missing. One day, the rabbi met him and asked him what was wrong. So Goldberg immediately came to the point. For fifty years, rabbi, I've come to the synagogue. Then for the first time, I asked for something. I prayed to win the national lottery. I kept praying. I didn't win. So why should I come anymore? God didn't answer my prayer. The famous like joke quip, you know, you can plug in any variable you want and everybody's used this, okay? You're mistaken, said the rabbi. God didn't answer your prayer. It's just that the answer was no. Mm. Sometimes, we, uh, I had a rebbe used to teach us. He said, sometimes Abba says no. Yeah, and you, if you have little kids or you have little, little uh, uh, you know, grandchildren and you know well grandchildren we never say no to but... <laughs> right but but you know if you have to say no it's like Abba didn't know Abba didn't get it. yeah no Abba, Abba, Abba didn't yeah he answered you said no um okay um I like this story because in its gentle way it reminds us of a difficult truth the hardest word to hear in any language is the one that means no I know many good and thoughtful people find it difficult to understand why Judaism or for that matter all the great religions of Revelation contain so many thou shalt nots. Does God really mind what we eat or who we marry or what we do on the seventh day? Surely faith, they say, is about the big positive spiritual thing, love, compassion, justice, and peace. God, just have to be a good person. Does God care if I turn the light on on Shabbos? I, I, how many times I heard that? Okay. Um, can we really experience the divine and the small print of biblical law, the dense thickets of prohibition? Surely these are the work of men anxious to build walls around the citadel of faith. I ah, love the words. God is too vast to be concerned about the minutia of human behavior. God is in the great yes, not the small-minded no. But think about it. How many positive commandments, how many negative commandments in the Torah? No, it's in the Torah out of 613. Right. And 365. 365 negatives and i said this all the time and we have to find the 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 smooth edge of both sides of the sword because often when we talk to and i say this every time i've asked young people especially free word association with shabbos it's always negative mm. everything i can't do when you're older it changes it's like oh. You know, like that, like, like okay. right, exactly, exactly. So, but, but, so we have to find positive but at the same time. We have to appreciate that there are negatives as well. I can, I have much sympathy for this line of thought, but I wonder whether it can really be so. Every affirmation is also a denial. Every commitment is also a gesture of self-restraint. Without the strength to say no, we lack the ability to say yes. When two people pledge themselves to one another in marriage, they're saying no to adultery. We hope. When two friends speak in confidence, they are tacitly agreeing not to share their remarks with others. Without restraint, there could be no trust. Our yes implies a no. We don't usually frame it that way. That's an interesting way to put it. Um, because you know, you're looking at what's in front of you right now, not what's not there. Something of the kind applies to every serious achievement. Unless we could say no to distractions, we'll never finish the book or run the marathon or fix the leaking tap or take the time we promised to spend with our children. Something always crops up to turn our mind to other things. Prioritize. One of the siren calls of our culture is having it all. Behind it lies the idea that we can do or be or have everything, if not all at once, then at least serially. There are no hard choices, no irreconcilable conflicts, no genuine dilemmas. There is no yes to something that entails a definite no to something else. This is the ethics of fantasy. Fortunately, well, I'm going to open the door. Um... Fortunately, welcome back. Fortunately, the real world regularly reminds us that there are things that need genuine commitment, even courage. 
To be a faithful marriage partner, a good parent, a true friend, a decent employer, employee involves the kind of loyalty that says loyalty that says no to a hundred temptations. Out of such no saying, moral strength is forged. I tell my kids all the time, and they make fun of me and they quote me with terrible people. I said, you know, it's very easy to get married. It's a lot harder to stay married. I will never forget the woman I met who spent her life curing teenagers of drug addiction. When what I asked her, did she do that made the difference to their lives? She replied. I'm probably the first person they've met who cared enough about them to say no. As she to them, so God to us. Interesting perspective. Um, now they're saying no and they're saying no. If you remember that great movie, uh, analyze this. And the, the criminal's name was a comedy, but his name was Mr. VD. And they said, Mr. VD, doesn't anyone ever say no to you? He says, yeah, all the time. No, no, please, no, please. Like, <laughs> so, uh, steel trap of a mind for nonsense, let me tell you. Um, that's why God gave us movies. The the agenda, we're, we're witnessing now, I don't know how much exposure you have to it. I have two, more than I ever want. Uh, a generation of entitlement where no one ever said that you failed. No one ever said you did poorly. Because God forbid they would have to go to their rubber room and they would have to talk about their feelings. And I mean, my daughter, who's in the corporate world now, explains to me like the kind of things you can get days off for. It's just wild. Absolutely wild. I'm not talking about like holidays. I'm saying like if if, if you have like pet bereavement day or something like I'm like, I, I don't know if you, or if you just feel like I, I need to. I don't, they have all these words. I don't even know what they are. And that's but that's part of the culture. And it's and and people like half half work they don't, they don't want to work because no one ever made them work no one told them the value of work they just said whatever you do is amazing oh you struck out three times you're gonna get a trophy you're you're incredible it's good that you showed up right so i was not raised that way and i'm glad my father didn't live to see this because oh boy um i'm glad he didn't live to see a lot of things but the the and, and dealing with it certainly in um when when I had a very long conversation with a colleague yesterday and uh, he's a conservative rabbi and about assistance and hiring and the field and the future, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just so bleak. And he says like, first of all, they're, they're not, they don't know anything, but they can't do anything because they have no, they have no idea how to deal with people. But it also says like you give them a task and they just, it takes them like weeks and weeks. They just can't do it. And like, what, like, what the heck? Like, just, Sit down and do it, but people can't do it. Another friend of mine is with another colleague. Goes, so he hired somebody, all promising thing. It turned out to be like the biggest disaster of his of his career because, and and then you end up having to pick up the slack and then to deal with the fallout, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what happens, right? So that leads us to the miraglim. Miraglim is is. I'm I'm getting a little, especially this year. I'm getting a lot more insight into into what's how. I'll talk about it on Shabbos probably a little bit, but the. Like, how could good people go so wrong? Because Rashi tells us that that Kulam Anashim, they were not slouches. They were not nachschleppers. These were fine, upstanding, meritorious individuals who were selected specifically for this job. Were they selected to fail? I don't know. Maybe. That's, there's an argument to be made there. But how could they, how could they get it so wrong? But it's not like they, just, they were like meh. They were like, mm, no. And they and they and they and everybody listened to it. It's something to to think about. So, um, so what we've seen is, is that sometimes when when if you don't want to hear no or you don't want to accept truth, you will go out of your way to do anything to not accept the truth, even cause harm to others, which has become much more clear for us to understand this year. Is that if I can't handle your belief or your truth and it conflicts with my truth or I don't want to admit what's real, I will go out of my way to hurt you. Not walk the other way or live and let live. No, I'll go out of my way to hurt you, which we have seen time and time and time and time again. And by the way, but I, I go figure, look what happened in LA yesterday. Yeah. Look at that. Look at, look at, you know, you could, you could break into a college building and cause all kinds of damage, and you don't even get a slap on the wrist, right? Because 
right? So why not? Why not? And, and that's what the world does in the media. Da, 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 da. Now we could play victim, but uh, but but it's it's a huge uphill battle for us to to fight. And you understand though, it was what when you so the the, the Miraglim, they knew that Israel was good. They knew that Hashem promised them. So you have to find out what was that nikuda, what was that 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 one point that threw them off that there was a truth they didn't want to admit to. So I found the source for this. Mm. You're gonna have to come back and show us. <laughs> <laughs> the Zohar, the Zohar. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm, 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 I, it's not often that I quote from the Zohar. It's not. It's not often. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna show. I'm gonna read it to you because I actually just copied it. It's from the Zohar. Because you know I quote the Zohar. Nor, nor am I, but alas. So the Zohar says, Kulahu Zakain Havu. Vereshe Distral Havu. They were all worthy. They were all heads of state. What are you reading, sir? What are you reading from? The Zohar. Zohar. Like legit Zohar, not like Uri Zohar and not, you know who he was? Uri uh, Zohar. And not, not a war. This is the actual Zohar. From that, that volume, the blue volume right on top of my head. Can you see it? I'll put it on the camera. There you go. There you see on top there. There it is. Um, and listen to what it says. Aval inan dibru le garmaihu ita bisha. Am I not le ita da? This is like this is like reading Greek, right? El amru iyalun yisro la ara nis avra anon mamalhem ni ration viim ni motion ration acharine. So they said, wait a minute. Moshe pointed us for this position, and they're like, wait a minute. That's it for us. When we go into Israel, we're going to be nothing. Moshe is going to appoint other people to take over. And we're going to amount to nothing. Right? Here, we could be a macher. This is what the Zohar says. And, 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 but um, I, I'm just, I just came across the Zohar. I'm reading it to you. Um and because of this, and they decided to, oh, well, maybe if we don't go to Israel, then we can remain in charge. If I can, if I dissuade everyone, and because of that, they died, I'm going to listen to them died. What is that? What is that? Three things that take you out of this world. The mission prayer gives us Kina, Tava, and Kavod. 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 Ego. Honor. Honor. It's it's the most unbelievable thing in the world that people um, like you could do anything you want to them. You can go, but if you take away like their honor, take away the aliyah they think that they're supposed to have. I, I, I over the years I got so many phone calls I stopped counting of how come I didn't get. Anybody starts a sentence with that? The Gemara says that if you run away from kavod, then kavod runs after you. But if you run after Kavod, mm. then the Kavod will run away from you. Mm. Okay? So um, there was a guy who came to the Hasidish Rebbe, and he says, if I, I says, I'm running away from Kavod my whole life. How come it, it's not following me? He says, because <laughs> while you're running, you're peeking over your shoulder like this. <laughs> like, you go like this. Um, and, and, just, and just think about it. It's, it's, it's a, uh, it's, and, and, and nobody is exempt from this. Nobody. Nobody. The question is, how do you handle it? Um, and I mean, there, there are. Uh, I, I learned from my father. I, I learned certain things from my father, right? So um, I never, ever, unless I'm in a professional realm, I never introduce myself as rabbi ever, ever. I just don't, because like, what is that? What is that? If I'm in a different shul and they want to give me an aliyah, I never say hurrah. I, I just don't, because that's like that's how my father raised me. I'm like you, don't, you don't do that. Um, and so many times I've, I've just. Like and again, it's part of the pot. I talk about the future generation. Also, a lot of people, as they want to go into my line of work, for specifically the reason of kavod, mm -hmm. which is the <laughs> because with all due respect, we know it follows, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> no respect is following. It's 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 a very 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 hard thing, um, and so according to the Zohar, the Miraglim, because they 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 couldn't deal with that truth. Which was covered, that they were covered mongering, 
And they were able, willing to turn the entire world upside down, which led to death. Theirs and others. But that's but that's the human psyche that we're so... Is there a word in the text that the Zohar somehow mixes? This... <sighs> I don't know. It's. I mean, it's uh, not everything is found in the text. Can we just reverse that? So it's jealousy, kava, what was the third? Um... Hina Tava Kava. Tava is desire. Right? And, where, and not where, the song by you two. And where is that? It's where a mission in Perkyabos. Kina Tava Vakava Motse Sadam and all. It's a great song by you two, by the way. I almost had such a different feeling than this on the Moral Fun. It almost felt like they were altering their beliefs because they knew who their audience was. You always say when you're a good mm -hmm. speaker, you know your audience. And their audience, all they did was complain, 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 complain. So if they would have said everything's great, they wouldn't have been accepted. Mm -hmm. So they altered what they were thinking to fit the audience. Okay, I'm going to push back on that a big deal okay. because a lot of the complaining did not happen until afterwards. But they complained about the food okay. and then the and, and, raining but, down of the food. And what, happened, and, what happened, and what happened as soon as the, they got what they wanted? It stopped. And they complained about the water and then the food. Yeah, and they got the water and they got the food and they got okay. people complain. Um, but to say that you're going to change Hashem's word just to pander, I don't think so. I, I Hashem's but, word, but how they but presented the, their findings. What's saying, the but benefit to them? Yeah, like why triggering the additional complaint? Right, that everyone will love them. Everyone will love them people because they're like because they serve, if they say so, there's a salvation at the end. So then that's the same thing. That's cover. That right, would be saying, uh, right, but a different right. So then it comes back to the same thing. I, I, I don't. It, it, it's 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 very very tough, and we're still we're still we're still we're still paying for it. I don't know. Um, and and of all weeks, um, you know, of all years, the shlach about how people speak about Israel. I'm sure every rabbi in the world is going to talk about you know lashon hara against Israel. Okay, and I said so. We had we had actually a beautiful shal uh, shadas. Yafit's not here because she's at home crying. Um, yesterday, Avi made aliyah. It was amazing. It was, it was it was just really so proud of him. So we did a whole thing at Shal Shudas. We had a huge crowd. It was really nice. And I found there's a special Misha Berch that you make for someone to make an Aliyah. And I said, you know, there's a Yom Aliyah that was created a few years ago, but it's in Parsha's Lech Lecha. But if they had a second place, it would be this Parsha. Mm -hmm. So we had just read Parsha Shlach at Milcha, Alu Zeba Negev, Alisem, Sahara, Aliyah, like the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a, a nice presentation. It was really nice. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and Shabbos yeah. Agarol. Shabbos Agarol was a drasha, right. Oh. Um, but there was a Mishaberich. So I read the Mishaberich. It was nice. And I gave him a copy yeah. of it. Um, yeah. So, and you know what he said to me? The nicest thing, Avi? It, mean, it means a lot to me. Like little things that people don't realize that it means a lot to me. He says, you know, you weren't here for my bar mitzvah, but at least now I got the personalized speech. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, bar mitzvah is bar mitzvah. is like a thing here. It's, right? <laughs> bring it back. Bring it back. I had a long talk with uh, Gonan at the party the other night. We were talking, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, in Philadelphia, okay, 203. Philadelphia, oh my gosh, it's Philadelphia. Rabbi, come on. You know, there was a raffle. You know, first prize was one night in Philadelphia. You know what second prize was? Two nights in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> my sister went to Temple. Oh, she had to sleep in for a bunny. The university, yeah. It's very sticky down there. It gets like sticky. Yeah. And they have these places you can't pronounce and they don't sound like they spell Bella Kinwood. Like it's a, I don't know. <laughs> in Philadelphia, there lives a gentle, gracious, gray-haired man by now in his late 90s whom Elaine and I have the pleasure of meeting several times and is one of the most lovely people we've ever known. That would be a nice thing to say. Rabbi Sachs, in his book, wrote this about me. Not bad. Many people have reason to be thankful for him to him because he was his work has transformed many lives, rescuing people from depression and other debilitating psychological states. Okay, I'll go for that too. Maybe I should look him up. His name is Aaron T. Beck, and he's the founder of one of the most effective forms of psychotherapy yet devised, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT they call that, okay? Um, to be sure, not everyone is convinced of the effectiveness of it, et cetera, et cetera, fine. Anyway, um, that's because neither point affects the argument of this essay, I like that. Um, <laughs> He discovered it through his work at the depression research clinic he found in the University of Pennsylvania. It's, just, it's a nice name, depression research clinic. Like anybody walking into that building, like 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 this. Oh, uh, you know, we, we we had a family outing while we had everybody home for like a minute, so we went to go see the second Inside Out movie. Oh, it's so depressing. I can't. Mm -hmm. Those movies, I, I don't like them. I don't like the first one. I don't like the second one. It's cute, but I, I just I don't like it. But you know, 
things going on inside your head. It just it plays with your mind. Anyway, my mother, she'll live and be well. She's a noted uh, child psychiatrist, and she had the most difficult cases. She At one place she worked back in Valhalla. I remember how long it was, in the, in the late 70s. I remember taking she took me to work there, and it was called MRI, Mental Retardation Institute is what it was called. Because, you know, you could say that back then. And I remember she took me and I'm like, mom, why are the locks on the outside of the doors mm. and not the inside? Because they had the kids, you know, with the helmets on, like a really great hall. And she dealt, that was, my, that was her specialty. And understands a lot about me, how she put up with me. Um, so he began to detect a pattern among the patients. It had to do with the way they interpreted events. They did so in negative ways that were damaging to their self-respect and fatalistic. It was as if they had thought themselves into a condition that one of Beck's most brilliant disciples, Martin Seligman, was later to call learned helplessness. Essentially, they kept telling themselves, I'm a failure. Nothing I try ever succeeds. I am useless. Things will never change. Now, we all know people like this. People who are extremely talented. People who are extremely well-liked, but they have such a poor image of self or interpretation of what they are doing that this is what naturally comes out. And, it's, and, and the saddest part is that they're the only ones that don't see how great they are. Everybody sees how great they are and tell them, but you could tell them ad nauseum, it won't matter because they just cannot see it themselves for whatever deeply rooted psychological reasons there are. And if you're in the field of psychology, you could have a field day with this. They had these thoughts automatically. They were their default reaction to anything that went wrong in their lives. But Beck found that if they became conscious of these thoughts, saw how unjustified they were and developed different and more realistic thought patterns, they could in effect cure themselves. This also turns out to be a revelatory way of understanding the key episode of Shlach, namely the story of the spies. Now, again, that's why it's it's, it's sort of a little bit controversial. Not controversial, meaning like not everybody, not everybody holds of it, as they would say in Yeshiva. Not everybody holds of this because it's not so easy to just, oh, just, you know, look at it from a different angle and everything's fine to oversimplify. So recall what happened. Moshe sent 12 men to spy out the land. The men were leaders, princes of their tribes, people of distinction. Yet 10 of them came back with a demoralizing report. The land, they said, is indeed good. It does flow with milk and honey, but the people are strong. And there's a big but there, the word FS. But everything we follow with a but, but hmm, takes away everything that was there beforehand. The cities are large and well fortified. Kalev tried to calm the people down. We could do it, he said. He has the words. I said to Avi also on Chavez, Alona Ale. We could certainly go up. We could do this. We could accomplish this. But the 10 said that it couldn't be done. The people are stronger than we are. They're giants. We are grasshoppers. And so the terrible event happened. The people lost heart. If only they said we had died in Egypt, let us choose a leader and go back. Hashem became angry. Moshe pleaded for mercy. Hashem relented, but insisted that none of that generation, with the sole exceptions of the two dissenting spies, Kalev and Yoshua, would live to enter the land. The people would stay in the wilderness for 40 years, and there they would die. Their children would eventually inherit what might have been theirs had they only had faith. We had learned this in the text a couple of years ago, that it wasn't, Hashem didn't forgive them, he just gave a stay of execution. That you're not going to be killed now, but you're all going to die, and you're going to be killed over the next 38 years, and it's changed. Essential to understanding this passage is the fact that the report of the ten spies was utterly unfounded. Only much later in the book of Joshua, when Yeshua himself sent spies, did they learn from the woman who sheltered them, Rachav, what actually happened when the inhabitants of the land heard the Israelis were coming. We learned this also. See, we're well, we're well trained for this. I know the Lord has given you the land. The dread has fallen. Man, you talk about namas, where everybody's melted. Um, all the inhabitants, they melt in fear. Before. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no courage left in any of us because we were scared. We were scared to death that you were coming. The spies were terrified of the Canaanites and entirely failed to realize that the Canaanites were terrified of them. How could they make such a profound mistake? For this, we turn to cognitive behavioral therapy and to some of the types of distorted thinking identified by Beck student David Burns. One is, okay, this is like a, maybe we should like lie down on the couch for this. I don't know. I feel like that. I mean, I, I should. Man, I would say I was my mother's case study. She told me I was adopted. I'm starting to appreciate that now, seeing my siblings, but um, she's watching this. It's okay. One one is all or nothing thinking. Everything is either black or white, good or bad, easy or impossible. That was the spy's verdict on the possibility of conquest. It couldn't be done. There was no room for shading, nuance, complexity. He could have said it will be difficult. We will need courage and skill. But with God's help, we will prevail. But they didn't. Their thinking was a polarized either or. Or either or. How are you going to say it? 
Um, imagine, imagine, let's say, if we look at the last 75 years in the state of Israel, if they had that attitude. No, there's no way we could do it. There's no way we could. Uh, let's just give up now. Or there's no way we'll figure out how to, you know, make water out of air or how to do all, all, all the million gazillion things that they've given to the world. Ingenuity, not just militarily, but just technologically and just know how. And even though they can't figure out how to make a sink that doesn't get all over you, they can't figure out how to make a shower door that goes all the way across the shower. It has to be a half a door. All those things they can't figure out, but they can figure out how to make, you know, uh, a desert bloom. Right. If they would have had that all in an attitude, you know, there'd be nothing. There'd be nothing to talk about. Right. Um, so um, another is negative filtering. You could do like a little test study when you go home, like ask people, what do they fall into? Negative filtering. We discount the positives as being insignificant and focused almost exclusively on the negatives. The spies began by noting the positives. The land is good. Look at the fruit. But then came the but. Here it is. The long string of negatives drowning out the good news and leaving an overwhelmingly negative impression. They say, let's say in, in managerial courses or if you ever have to... Uh, Give someone criticism. You know what they call that? They call it the criticism sandwich. Mm -hmm. Say something good. Give the constructive criticism. Then say something good again. Sandwich it in the middle. Um, because sometimes people tend to hear maybe what they last heard or they'll only focus on that. But here it's negative filtering. Yeah, yeah, it's good. They have big grapefruits and like the giant grapes. And yeah, that's great. But oh my God, it's still. Well, Esther is kind of like that, but not to a negative extent. Right, right, so, right. You know, here's what we really want. No, because You're awesome and thank you. <laughs> no, but and, and 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 the way we say it is that you can't you can't go and ask your parent for a new bike the second they like drop the briefcase home from work and they're coming in and the train was delayed for the fourth time this week, New Jersey Transit. And oh, I want a new bike. No, how mom, how was your day? You look pretty today, mom. I don't commute, so my wife does. I'm just using that as an example. Can I get you a drink? They ever tell you how you're such a good mom. You're the best. Like, you know what? It must have been really hard for you to be out in the hot weather today. And how many patients did you see today? <laughs> this is exactly how it goes down in my house every night, <laughs> except never. And and then, by the way, you know, mom, I would love if I could like have some help with my homework. Thus, I'm sorry for what I did. If I, you know, I, you know, slicha, um, mechila. I would love to be able to, could we do something this weekend? Oh, can I get a new bike? And after that, I just want to say again, like I really appreciate like that you're my mom and you take such good care of us and you, you make us dinner and Shabbos. And we're so lucky. I, I don't think we say it enough for everything that you do to us. That's Shemon Esra in a nutshell. Right? Because you can't just, the second, if you, if, if Hashem, we walk into Shul, God, give me, give me, give me, give me, let me do all my tests. See ya. Who are you? But we have a lot of negative filtering and there are people that, you know, you could say a million, million good things and they'll just pick out the one negative or great things can happen and they'll pick out the one negative. The third is, I don't know how to pronounce it, right? Catastrophizing. Expecting disaster to strike, no matter, to strike no matter what. This is what the people did when they said, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us die by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. We are very good as Jews at catastrophizing. Did I say that right? Catast yeah, catastrophizing. We are always waiting for the other shoe to drop. We don't like having too much good news. We don't like having too much success. We, I don't know if this is a grain from our parents, grandparents, grandparents, or this is just Jewish history, but <clears throat> we don't like it when things are okay. Like, it's just, th this can't be. There's, there's, a, there's a trick, right? Something, something you have a, a deal that's too good to be true. <clears throat> Maybe it is too good to be true, but we as Jews were always like, no, nah, there's this there's gotta be something awful happening, right? It can't be. So um the fourth is mind reading. We assume we know what other people are thinking. When usually we are completely wrong because we're jumping to conclusions about them based on our own feelings, not theirs. That's what the spies did when they said, We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and so we seem to them. They were saying how they 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 declared definitively how they looked in the eyes of others, which you honestly don't know. Haven't we all had encounters in our lives where we made certain assumptions or evaluations of other individuals, either about their persona or perhaps what they thought about us, and we were just completely off? Mm -hmm. Haven't we done that? And, and then you're like, you kick yourself, like, oh, I'm such a doofus. Like, I can't believe, like, I misread that. Or, But 
it's not that you misread because you have your own biases and you see things the way you see it. And, you know, you just didn't give somebody a chance, but something like, I don't know, maybe ask them what they have to say. So like I, I, I had a lot of like politician meetings lately. Now politicians are a whole different breed of something. Um, but, you know, and I, if somebody speaks to me in a certain way and, 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 presents an agenda or presents a position. And I say, I'm going to take somebody at their word until they know differently. I'm not going to just assume that, oh, no, everything they say is bad or everything they say it's good, which is why the political polarization in our country is so awful. You can't, the, the person that you don't like, whichever side, whichever party, whatever, anything, and there's plenty of people to choose from that you don't like, right? But anything they say is true. Anything they do is bad. And everything that my person does is good anything about this is bad you can't bifurcate the two and say no, no no it's possible that yeah i don't care for this candidate but he did this x and y right or this what he said made sense or the person that i support yeah i have a problem with something that that he or she did right huge it's a huge 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 day today by the way in new york i mean it's the they set the record for the most spending on a congressional race ever in the history of congressional race and let's just hope that uh this this one pans out but not only for today but it has huge ramifications going forward for other squad members races because if jamal bowman and Hashem, Hashem is Baruch Hashem, should lose today um and george latimer whom i've met is a very very decent guy and um and if he loses, that means that the progressives and in the squad caucuses or whatever they raise their money from, they're not going to invest as much in other races like Cory Bush and things like that in St. Louis. So it's uh, it's very, very, very important and very active. And, and and the vote, I was talking to people from Westchester yesterday and like the people, like all the early voting was done already. Like, How do you want to be doing? Okay. nobody was challenging us, you know. What? And, and was not really, not really. It was a, it was a, it was, it was Nita Lowy. She was a, a long time uh, stalwart. I remember her as when I was a kid that she was our congressman. Um, and it just, you know, something when there's a vacuum and they jump in and people don't realize what they're getting into because he, he said all the right things at first, you know, progressive and this. Da, da, da. Um, so if you see all those ads on TV, which I'm sure you can't watch anything with that, and, and it's United Democracy, that's APAC, by the way. It's a United Democracy project. Those are APAC ads. And it's, but notice there was not a thing in them about Israel or anything. It's all about his record and against the Democratic Party, et cetera, et cetera, because they understand, they, they know what they're doing. Um, but Latimer was ahead by, by double digit points, but that doesn't mean anything until the end of today. So let's hope. Um, and then that farce that they put on in the park, I, I mean, it's just, it was just it's sad. I was sad for America when to see the guy jump around in a t shirt dropping, you know. For Fanny like that, and she's jumping around like I'm a sugar, like at a concert, and I mean, and Bernie Sanders, um, I don't know. I have a question whether we could count him for a minion. I don't. Know. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's beyond the scope. Um, so they're they're so they're catastrophes. A, a mind reading, like we know we know what they think. We know. They also, by the way, there's another thing on the other flip side of that, and. Many great Israeli leaders have said that, but historical leaders is that if somebody says that they want to kill you, believe them. They mean it. Don't think, ah, that's just rhetoric. No, no. If they say they want to hurt you, if they say they want to kill you, they mean it. They had no way of knowing how they appeared to the people of the land, but they attributed to them mistakenly a sentiment based on their own subjective fears. The fifth is an inability to disconfirm. You reject any evidence or argument that might contradict your negative thoughts. The spies heard the counter-argument of Kalev, but they dismissed it. They decided that any attempt to conquer the land would fail, and they were simply not open to any other interpretation of the facts. Some of my mind is made up. I don't want to hear it. Don't confuse me with the facts. Okay? Does that sound familiar? Don't confuse me with the facts. Uh, you know, genocide, free Palestine, this and that. I, I had a I have a minute for a second, for one second, to at the Israel Day Parade to walk down Fifth Avenue with a sign that said Free Palestine. And then with a drop down thing, it says from Hamas. But, you know, I, I didn't do that. I wasn't going to. But I mean, that does, you could prove me all the facts you want. And you know that retractions and corrections in newspapers get printed in a small corner on the page 48. And the big stories before they're proven true are on page one. That's how it works. The sixth is emotional reasoning, letting your feelings rather than careful deliberation dictate your feelings, your thinking. 
A key example is the interpretation of the spies placed on the fact that the cities were fortified and very large, or with the walls up to the sky. They didn't stop to think that people who need high city walls to protect them are in fact fearful. Had they stopped to think, they might have realized that the Canaanites were not confident, not giants, but invul not invulnerable. But they let their emotions substitute for thought. Don't let the facts get in the way. Um, this is a, a a new argument that people have in a woke culture today. Is and it's a term. That, you know, I'm learning all these terms as I go along, and it's just mind boggling to me. Some of them, but this is my lived experience. If you say my lived experience, it's like a it's like an HR go to you know staple. That it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong for sure. But my lived experience as a white colonialist settler of foreign lands is, by the way, I'm not a white colonial settler. I'm not. It's the funniest thing when they accuse Israel of being white colonial settlers when most of the people in Israel are not white and they've been colonialized more than the rest of colonization for the, for history. Like how many people colonize? I mean, come on. Anyway, um, you could go to town with this. I'm just saying this is, this is, this is, if Rabbi Sachs were writing this today, the seventh is blame. We accuse someone else of being responsible for our predicament instead of accepting responsibility mm -hmm. ourselves. Oh, uh, maybe I should just read this for the sermon. That'll be good. Um, this is what the people did in the wake of the spies report. They grumbled against Moshe and Aaron, as if to say, it's all your fault. If only you had let us stay in Egypt. People who blame others have already started down the road of learned helplessness. They see themselves as powerless to change. They are passive victims of forces beyond their control. I, I I know and I accept and I and I, when I mentor younger colleagues, I explain to them that sometimes when people are yelling or screaming or complaining, it's not about you. It's about the chair that you're sitting in, and that's a likely target. Right? That's just that's just what happens, and, and and they can't help themselves. Sometimes it's warranted. Sometimes it's not. But uh, you know, so, sometimes when when. People's associations with, with a rabbi might be during the worst moments of their lives if they have no other positive interaction. And every time they see the rabbi, they associate with a negative part of their lives, mm -hmm. a horrible loss that they incurred or a horrible situation that they had to endure. And the rabbi was there. And then when they, every time they see him, you know, every six or eight or 12 months, like they see him and like uh, they get that feeling of that brings them right back. So you have to understand that you have to be self-aware. But we, people love to blame people. Not everything needs somebody to be, blamed, to be blamed. Sometimes things go wrong, yes. But not everything has to be attributed to this is what happened, this is what somebody did wrong. Sometimes things just happen. It just, it just happens. And now not to say we're not going to try to fix it, we're not going to try to make it better, we're not going to try to improve in the future, but it doesn't mean that somebody has, somebody's head has to roll as a result of it. That's not, that's not, that's not the life. So applying cognitive... Cognitive behavioral therapy. Oh, he said they're, they're powerless to change, passive victims. Okay. The story of the, the spies lets us see how ancient event might be relevant to us here now. It's very easy to fall into these and other forms of cognitive distortion, and the result can be depression and despair. Dangerous states of mind that need immediate medical or therapeutic attention. Right? One of the largest industries in this company, in this country, in the world, pharmaceutical industry dealing with right mental health and all different types of avenues there's a there's going to be a huge there already is but there's gonna be a huge adderall shortage even worse now for whatever reasons anyway what i find profoundly moving is the therapy that Torah itself prescribes i pointed out elsewhere that the end of the part the paragraph dealing with tzitzis is connected to the episode of the spies by the two words uri isem right it says and latour velosa suru and latour lachem and uri isem as earth uri isem osam is both words are used multiple <clears throat> uh, matches. We have them. And by the way, the beginning of the parsha is Muraglam, the end of the parsha is Tzitzit. So it bookends the entire parsha and these connective words. The key sentence is the one that says about the thread of the blue and the Tzitzit, that when you see it, Risemo so, you remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and not follow after your own heart and your eyes. Right, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we know we said Shema. Note the strange order of the parts of the body. Normally, we expect it to be the other way around, as Rashi says in his commentary the verse. The eyes see and the heart desires. Ha'ayin ro'e v'halev chomed, Rashi says. First we see, then we feel. But in fact, the Torah reverses the order, thus anticipating the very point cognitive behavioral therapy makes, which is that often our feelings distort our perception. 
we see what we fear and often what we think we see is not there at all. Hence Roosevelt's famous words in his first inaugural address, stunningly relevant to the story of the spies, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. The blue thread in the Titsis the Gemara says, is there to remind us of the sea, the sky, and God's throne of glory. Tchelis, the blue itself, was in the ancient world the mark of royalty. Thus, the tzitzis is itself a form of cognitive behavioral therapy thing. Don't be afraid, Hashem is with you. Don't give way to your emotions because you are royalty. You are the children of the king. Hence, the life-changing idea. Never let negative emotions distort your perceptions. You are not a grasshopper. Those who oppose you are not giants. To see the world as it is, not as you are afraid it might be, let faith banish fear. It makes perfect sense on paper, and I understand that in practice and reality, it's very, very, very hard. It, it, it can ruin people's lives, it can ruin relationships, it can ruin families. Some people just, and, and, and the studies, by the way, of second generation, and now they're looking at third generation trauma from people, you know, from the show up, things like that, or people have gone through any sort of emotional trauma, and it, it carries through through generations and the damage that can be done. And it's not so easy to repair. So people are trying and they're trying to have this in different types of therapy. So on paper, we could say, oh, um, and by the way, one thing you didn't add is, is, is oh, yeah, this is, none of this applies to me. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, 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 that's the other guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the rabbi's not talking about me. No, <laughs> the, the, we, we often say that, okay, is that, but if you think about it, Often we interpret things the way I think the last one really like we interpret things the way our heart sees it, our heart sees, right? Our eyes, our eyes can see just fine, but our hearts kind of like, and that's the lens through which we look at every single thing in the world. Is that if you have a an ex, a negative experience with I don't know whatever, you're gonna your your vision is gonna be jaded. You're just not gonna see things like somebody else would, which is why which is. Really fascinating when you when you have different people look at the same piece of art, mm -hmm. or or the Rorschach check test things like things like that. Like, what do you see? But often that's meant to interpret. It's like, well, what what what? what it's not so much what you see, but it's like, what do we see in you? Like, how are you looking at this? Because nothing is absolutely uh, the same for everybody, um, and that's and that's what we're dealing with. So that's that's that, that's shalach. And, and, and but it, we we really need that insight, and especially now about how it's possible that that it went so bad so quickly. Um, and so just destructively, and that's it's, it's a big challenge. And, and look, the whole story of the Jewish people changed because of that. So if not for them, I wouldn't have tissue well, you know, it made our whole summer so much better. I don't know, but anyway, um, so just my, we're not going to meet next week because I have to do because uh, the you get to do the dance of double camp drop off. Um, and, Huh? But I have to schlep into the bus. Bus don't come to Essex County. You have to go to Bergen. I have to go to two stops in Bergen County. Wow. One in 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 Paramus, one in Englewood. Uh Lavi. Lavi. Um yeah, Moshe's going to Lavi. They won't take a Marsha yet. Um he's the wrong grade. And I just pray, let's we should please have me in mind in your feelings that you should stay the whole summer and not be excused for reasons <laughs> that My mother had a son who was thrown out of things. And he's not my brother. <laughs> but uh yeah.